Welcome back, everyone. I hope you grabbed yourself a caffeinated beverage because if you've heard Jim Laval speak before, you know that you are in for a treat for the next hour and your pencil is going to be on fire by the end of it. Um, really excited to introduce Jim Laval, our next speaker. Um, he's a cl clinical pharmacist and board certified clinical nutritionist with over 30 years experience in the wellness, prevention, and disease state management. He's written 19 books, 200 plus articles, three database databases. Um, he's on faculty at several universities, and he's also developed the Metabolic Code Lifestyle Guidance Portal, which has now been taught to over a thousand healthcare professionals, and we're excited to say is available now through Emerson as well. Um, he has a rich clinical experience, um, founded and operated a successful practice at the Laval Metabolic Institute, one of the largest integrative practices in the country where he's treated over 10,000 patients. He has received Clinician of the Year from the Natural Products Association, and truly, I've had the pleasure of getting to know him over the course of the last year, and he's really one of my favorite teachers to learn from. So no doubt you're going to enjoy this presentation. So Jim, go ahead and take it over. Jacqueline, thank you so much. You know, what we're going to talk about today is, is kind of the emerging topic, which a lot of us probably have had our arms around it for a long time, but now we're coining this term called metaflammation or metabolic inflammation and inflam aging or inflammatory aging. And we're gonna look at it through the lens of biomarkers and really start to understand trend analysis. You know, it's easy for us to look at things when you know someone already has a lab value that's out of range, but what we really wanna understand is where is a person going? Meaning where are they trending to so that we can start to intervene at earlier and earlier times and then also start to really get targeted approaches to helping them balance their chemistry. So the first piece to understand is that, you know, what is your metabolism? What's well, way more than just burning calories. It's, it's the sum total of all the biochemical reactions going on right now that drive how you're feeling today, but it also creates the chemistry that's moving you towards your future health. So whether we look at this through the lens of epigenetics and go, oh my gosh, by the time I hit 65, I did, I did my, my aging clock and it says I'm 75 and I've accelerated that aging pattern. In the end, where your chemistry sits today actually is the sum total of everything that's gone on from the time you were gestated, right? From genetics, through all the metabolic perturbations into your epigenetic expression dictates where you're at. And it's really under the direct influence of metaflammation, meaning that the more that we allow chronic metabolic disruptors to disorient our homeostasis, the quicker we're going to bring on metabolic dysregulation. And of course, you know, the aging process, which I consider aging as a disease, not simply a fact that we're getting old. And, you know, this is kind of what we try to do. You know, whether you're looking at a, a salivary or urinary cortisol or looking for toxic metals or looking at biotoxins or looking at food allergens, in the end, what we're really doing is we're looking at these constructs of how a person is living. So whether they're smoking, are they over, do they have overnutrition? Are they, you know, time-restricted eating too much, which I'm finding a lot of my patients right now or you know doing 18 six fasts every day and, and i'm seeing disruptions in their lab values um how much alcohol do they take in what type of diet are they on is it right for them you know are they active are they inactive do they do they over train i have a lot of pro athletes that you know they're training three four hours a day and it's influencing their chemistry as if they were somebody that had severe metabolic dysregulation you know what's the drug use that they're on um, you know, we pioneered drug-induced nutrient depletion databases that showed you could be on certain medications depleting certain nutrients, and those nutrients could end up influencing the metabolic output of your chemistry. Then, of course, inadequate sleep, I think a hallmark trait of our American society, as well as, you know, obviously over the last 18 to 24 months, uh, chronic stress and mood disruptions, but all of these things are filtering into a funnel that lead to this chronic metabolic inflammation, um, which triggers these mechanisms like oxidative stress and insulin resistance and, and dyslipidemias, you know, compromised renal function, all these sorts of processes that go on that then distill down further into chronic 
illnesses, the non-communicable diseases. And I might add, if you're in metabolic inflammation and you get exposed to a communicable disease, as it was evidenced over the last you know, 18 to 24 months through the pandemic, uh, it makes you more prone for more inflammatory processes to occur. And, and, and you know, many of us realize already that people that are pre-diabetic or diabetic or people with heart disease already are in the process of a chronic low-grade equivocal infection in their body, that they have an inflammatory cytokine processes that are going on that are already setting the table for that accelerated aging process. And, you know, we want to look at it through the lens of all these things that we need to balance, right? So, you know, you know, you go to a seminar and the next thing you know, everybody's got adrenal issues or everybody has, you know, sex hormone issues or they're under excessive oxidative stress or it's glucose or it's their microbiome or it has to do with their CD4 and CD8 cells or where their neutrophils are at. But in the end, aging and performance and your vitality really is the the it, it's summarized with all of these levers or drivers of your chemistry. And of course, it gets down to your individuality and what's going on with your genetics. But more importantly, what are you doing that could be accelerating that epigenetic expression? And then even more importantly, what can we do to get it to turn around or turn off those expressions that are leading us towards accelerated aging and accelerated metabolic inflammatory processing. Because in the end, this is really, I, I think, a, a beautiful uh, depiction of, you know, I look at the terrain or the soil, right? We've always heard that the, the term terrain is this, gen, you know, and plus our genetic predisposition then gets, you know, stress, uh, lifestyle choices, environmental burden, uh, all of these things kind of fuel the feeding of this plant, this plant that is our health. And the bloom can be a weed, meaning cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases, autoimmunity, neurodegenerative disorders, and cancer. Or it can bloom to vibrant health with an increase in health span as we are aging. One of the things that I was have been committed in, in the last 37 years in practice is that I'm always looking to improve a way a person feels as quickly as possible. Because if I can get them to feel better quickly, I can get them to be committed and empowered to make sustainable changes so that their changes become a part of their lifestyle and not just a part of some heroic effort to get them back on their feet. And so understanding these disruptors to your current metabolic performance, that allows for strategies, and I would like to say precise or targeted strategies to turn off excessive metabolic signaling and then truly rejuvenate health at that cellular or mitochondrial level. And this is, you know, before we get into, you know, assessing labs and looking at it, you know, this is what we see every day, but it, yeah, this is a great model. So if you look at the far left, what you can see is that, you know, the stimulus for inflammation could be damaged cell debris, right? Excessive inflammasome activity, environmental burden, irritant chemicals. It could be a pathogen. It could be stress. It could be an intrinsic cell defect. You know, it, 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 you know so there could be any number of issues that turn on the proper inflammatory response which is trying to remove the damaged cell debris, trying to remove the irritants or the pathogens. And the net effect of that is to eliminate the cause of that inflammation, turn the inflammation off, and of course, re you know, return the body back to a healed or homeostatic state. The problem is, is that for many of us, the stressors are ongoing. So whether it, I'm not getting enough sleep, I'm under stress, uh, I'm being exposed to things, uh, maybe my diet's not correct, whatever, whatever the reason is, inflammation sets in. And one of the earliest signs of inflammation setting in, if you look over to the, to the left, and actually this one isn't even on this chart, are dyslipidemia. So things like oxidized LDL, apolipoprotein B, LPA, uh, looking at elevated TMAO levels, any of those types of numbers, even just real high LDL, right? I mean, we know that Chronic elevated cortisol causes an elevation in LDL cholesterol. And it's not just about LDL cholesterol, of course, it's about particle size and all those other kinds of things. So when you think of that, dyslipidemia right away makes you think 
uh oh, I've got a meta inflammatory state that's going on. The next thing that occurs is sarcopenia. Probably one of the most important things facing our plus 55 population. We have an epidemic of sarcopenia. People don't move enough. Uh, they don't exercise enough. They're just not active. And when you are in a meta-inflammatory state, you are in a catabolic state. So you have a tendency to lose muscle and, and lose that anabolic drive in your tissues. And remember, muscle is the currency of aging. When we have lean body mass, and remember, just getting people to diet's not enough because when people just do low calorie dieting uh, and they're losing weight, typically 30% of that weight loss is lean mass. So it's how do we really manage an individual appropriately so we get rid of the fat mass, retain or build lean mass. The next one, of course, is that we see anemias. And I know many of you have seen this in your cases where you see someone with a normal iron, but of just a bone dry ferritin, like where did the ferritin go? Well, it turns out that when you're under a metabolic inflammatory state or metaflammation, you, up, you upregulate hepcidin and you downregulate ferroportin. And when you downregulate ferroportin, you decrease uh, iron absorption and recycling. You also decrease ferritin uh, absorption and storage. And when I do that, it lowers my EPO production and signaling. So I'm, I'm sure if you start to look, watch out for that, you're going to see that really frequently. And that's a sign that there's metabolic inflammation in the body. Now, the next thing that happens is under inflammation, we start to see changes in the way in, uh, that insulin receptors function. So whether you're looking at interleukin-6 or TNF-alpha, we see an upregulation of toll receptor 4 and, and, and uh, the JAK kinase um, you know, sites, as well as a downregulation of the IRS-1 and IRS-2 activation. And what that means is, as I go from GLUT4 transport regulation of my glucose to, to transport one, and transport one of glucose means I'm going to make more, you know, more pyruvic acid, more lactic acid, and less ATP. Hallmark side signs of that person that's insulin resistant, right? They tell you they're fatigued. They don't have good muscle endurance. They're, they're hungry. They need carbs in order to fuel themselves. And that's because because of metabolic inflammation, the insulin receptors are no longer as, as efficient, and we use a different type of, of fuel capacity. And that means that I'm going to make two molecules of ATP instead of 38, thus 19 times less energy production uh, of ATP in that insulin resistant state. The next piece that happens is we start to see bone loss. And remember, bone loss is important for several reasons. One, obviously, you know, people are at risk when they when they lose bone. The older you are, you know, twenty percent of the elderly, uh, you know, will crack a hip, and uh, and and it can be fatal. You know, so if if you are in a situation where you you know get a bone break, you get a hip fracture. Twenty percent of those people that could be a fatality. Fifty percent may never walk uh, you know, independently again. But more importantly. Even in the 40 to 60 year old population, when you start to lose bone, that means you're creating an environment for placking of your arteries. There is a direct correlation to bone loss and coronary artery plaque. What are the other things that happen in this situation? Of course, um, neurogenesis issues occur. So we decrease neurogenic uh, growth factors like BDNF1. Uh, we lose neurogenesis. We lose cell plasticity. So under chronic inflammatory signaling, what basically happens is the progenitor cells or basically the stem cells for, for your neurons, they get blunted and you don't produce new dendritic pruned neurons that are available for work. So memory changes start to occur, hallmark sign of metabolic inflammation. The last and most important thing, which is a chronic feature across chronic degenerative diseases, mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's because we get elevations in cytokines like interleukin-6, um, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, that decreases respiration and ATP synthesis. Once again, going down to that two molecules of, of energy versus 38. Uh, and then we change our NAD to NADH ratio. Now, why is that a problem? Because we need a pool of NAD when our body gets assaulted. So for example, in the, in, in the pandemic example of SARS-CoV-2, when that spike protein hits, you suck up your NAD in order to activate your PPAR enzymes 
uh, in order to control the cytokine storm. Well, if I don't have a good pool of NAD, I'm not going to be able to do that. And then, of course, we downregulate the production of PGC1 alpha. And of course, PGC1 alpha is the progenitor uh, uh, or the, the preeminent um, cell signal which co-activates you know, thyroid receptors and neurochemical receptors and hormone receptors. So we start to get into this milieu of poor endocrine signaling. And remember, it's not just about how many hormones that you put on board on an individual. And I'm not just talking about sex hormones. I mean any hormone. It's about the efficiency in which they're functioning. Uh, so really important to realize those things. And so, you know, metaformation uh, increases the aging process. It increases both peripheral and central inflammation. And what I'm going to try to pull together for you is this thought process as a systems biology approach to metaflammation. And it's not always triggered by stress, but just think of it as what is the mechanisms that go on when you get under this high cortisol environment and all of a sudden you start to become insulin resistant because this cortisol goes up and IL-6 goes up, your insulin receptors start to become inefficient, right? You know, because you need to have more blood sugar in your bloodstream in order to fight the pending doom. Uh, you get alterations in your gut microbiome and the integrity of the gut lining, right? When cortisol goes up, you upregulate uh, clodin 2 and that causes the leakiness or the gapping in your epithelial tissues. You start to see alterations in your immune system, less T killer cell activation, uh, cognitive changes occur. Obviously, sleep problems occur when you get under high stress. Uh, so it's beginning to look at how do all these things play together? And then even more importantly, how do I know my plan is working to really stem the tide against metaflammation? And, you know, just as the example of stress, you know, stress, you know, as you start to alter your, your cortisol to DHEA ratio, it starts to alter your adiponectin levels. And why that's important, of course, is, is that adiponectin helps to co-activate the insulin receptor and is a real marker for kind of oxidative stress resiliency. And so, you know, this is one of the markers that I think are, you know, quite interesting. So, but it's more and then just, well, what's going on with my stress? What happens when I'm under stress? and my glucose is off, and my blood pressure is off, and my heart rate is going up, and my renal function is starting to drop because of the, my, my, my renal blood flow is reduced. It's tying all those pieces together to say how far along is a person, and then exactly how accelerated the processes are going on in their body. And so we developed this process called the, the, the metabolic code. And, and really what it was to, to do was to make it easier to target where to start with someone. Because all of us have had the situation where we look at a lab test and we go, oh my gosh, I could give this person 20 different things. But the reality is what you want to do is you want to start at the area where it's most focused. So basically all of the data, whether it's a questionnaire, biometrics, wearable, or their labs, filter into five different categories. And the reason that we chose five is because learning theory tells you that people learn in fives and threes. And we want to make it simple for people to understand, oh, I need to change this. Because all of us have felt victim to giving people you know, a 30-page report and we're writing little notes next to each one of the lab values and we're putting happy faces or frown faces or this has got to come up, this has got to come down. Then you write the nutrient that's next to it and then you hand that piece of paper to the patient and they walk out the door and they go, I, 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 I forgot everything you just told me, right? Because remember, patients going to forget about 80% of what you told them in the next 24 to 48 hours. And that's on simply a six to 10 minute visit, much less when we're doing in-depth work with individuals. So these are the five triads and they were all based on, you know, basically known metabolic networks and using labs that are accepted in, in healthcare and everybody agrees on them, right? So adrenal thyroid pancreas, that's about the triad of energy. You know, when, when your cortisol is right and your blood sugar is right and your thyroid hormones are good, you've got good energy and you've got vitality and you're able to get through your day and you've got resiliency, right? Because what we're really measuring here is metabolic reserve and resiliency. How far are you away from being well when you look across these five metabotypes? So we call these metabotypes. 
uh, because it's in the literature uh, that people fall into metabotypes and also metaflammation being in the literature. Now, the now gut immune brain, of course, that, you know, papers are coming out daily on gut immune brain is all about resiliency. You know, am I anxious? You know, am I depressed? Is my immune system weakened? Am I prone to colds and flus? Do I have irritable bowel? What's the status of my immune system in my gut? The third uh, metabotype is cardiopulmonary neurovascular. And of course, this is about endurance and stamina, right? And, and so what we see is, is that as people start to load more and more stress and their immune system is getting more disrupted, their journey starts to push into, say, triad three, and we see them start to become a vasculopath. And I, I'm going to show you an example of that uh, shortly by going through a sample lab. And of course, triad four is liver, lymph, kidneys. And even though we use one term called detox, it's the triad or metabotype of detox, it's way more than that, right? So, you know, we see the issues of people with, you know, reduced GFR, chronic kidney disease, people that are anemic, right? They've got elevated liver enzymes. But for the sake of communicating to the consumer or your patient, this is the triad of detox because they've heard detox. They understand stamina. They understand the word resiliency. They get the word energy. And of course, the fifth triad is about sex hormones uh, and testosterone and estrogen and progesterone. And so, you know, what this is really about is trying to figure out how can we get all of these functioning together so that we are able to, you know, really get someone to be at their best so they can either use a questionnaire in biometrics or they can add labs to it. Obviously, if you add labs, we think it's the most valuable. Um, we have three different panels that you can choose from. And then in addition to that, there are add-ons. And I'll show you an example of an add-on at the end of the presentation. And it uses trend analysis. For example, and I know I have it in here uh, in the future, but for every point above 84 on your blood sugar, it represents a 6% risk of becoming a person with diabetes in the next decade. That was about a 47,000 person study over 10 years. And then, of course, if you add on top of that a low serum potassium, which if it's below four or five, you have a fourfold risk of becoming diabetic in the next decade. And then if your blood pressure is up and you're overweight you know, and your lipids are off, getting dyslipidemia from insulin resistance, now all of a sudden I've strung together a string of pearls of dysfunction that says I really need to work on triad one or that, that pancreas because that is where all things downstream are being affected. And so this is the initial lab testing that we do. Uh, and of course, it's pretty comprehensive. You know, you look at biometrics and even get a urinary pH because we think that that's got a lot of value and even a salivary pH. But a differential CBC and CMP, looking at glucose, looking at hemoglobin A1C and insulin, obviously a comprehensive thyroid panel that can, you know, looks at all aspects of thyroid. Uh, you know, other components like homocysteine and C-reactive protein and sex hormones. We also, uh, when appropriate, we'll look at urinary hormone metabolites. We do a lot of urinary hormone metabolites, obviously, because when people are using bioidentical hormones, many times uh, their metabolites aren't being looked at or accounted for. And of course, that is important. And then we do a serum uh, cortisol, but you could also opt in to using something like a urinary or salivary circadian uh, cortisol. Uh, DHES, vitamin D, look at testosterone, of course, C-reactive protein, B12, red blood cell mag, iron ferritin, uh, you know, percent saturation, binding capacity, uh, and more appropriate, of course, from MPSA. Uh, and, and, uh, and then you can also add other things in that are important, such as uh, adiponectin, uh, glutathione, LPA, lipoprotein little a, LPPLA2, you know, uh, you know, lipid particle size, OxLDLs, you can read all of these. Uh, there's a lot of other markers that point towards chronic inf metabolic inflammation. One of the most important ones, which I know I'll detail a little bit later, is mean platelet volume. Just MPV, if MPV is high, you are more than likely under a meta-inflammatory state. And that's a simple one that you can look at. So the real goal of this is to show through conventional labs and advanced conventional labs where the person is at. Now, the beauty of this is, is now you can 
venture off from that and say, well, I'm going to need to do a uh, food allergy panel from Infinite Food Allergies, or I'm going to do a four-point salivary cortisol because I think the person needs it, or we're going to look at toxic metals, or we're going, you know, we're going to look at any other of these, or a urinary hormone test, right? You can venture off through Well of Eight Labs. You can actually start to come together with, okay, here is where this person is at, and I'm going to measure that. And then are the actions I'm taking regressing their metabolically inflamed state or not so that you can prove it? Because all of us um, want to prove that what we do matters. That was the whole purpose of building this platform was to be able to do data analytics on it and show that when we combine, whether it's drug therapy, nutrients, diet, breathing techniques, exercise, proper sleep and stress management, where does the needle move for an individual in a, in a way that we can publish and can validate, right? Because that's where, even in drug therapy, there's that weakness of when, you know, you're given three and four drugs at a time, there's no studies on it. So, you know, when you look at Metaflammation Labs, they all kind of fit into each of these triads. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think I'll be able to show it through the example of the, um, the test. So this is a test. And if you look here in this individual, this is a 47 year old male who's executive stress, he's overweight. And uh, if you look on the left, you see a metaflammation index score. This is the, on the far left, 995 is a metaflammation index. And, and so typically when we see these over 500, we know that there's some pretty big influences that are going on in that network. And these networks can stack on each other, meaning they're communicating with each other. Why we chose it this way was to be able to quickly communicate to a patient. Um, if you're a fan of Chinese medicine, you can think of Chinese five element theory, right? This is a, maybe a modern interpretation of whole body metabolism. So in this individual's case, they scored it incredibly high in adrenal thyroid pancreas. Uh, they then scored high in testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And they also still scored high in gut immune brain. So they got a lot going on. And then if you look here, they continue with a score in cardiopulmonary neurovascular over 500, and they just missed on liver, lymph, kidney. So, you know, where is this person going? Chronic metabolic inflammation is really starting to leverage into their chemistry, triggering accelerated aging, and most likely you'll see chronic disease that can take place. And so this was, uh, was their labs. And if you notice here, there wasn't a lot going on. Uh, their cortisol uh, at 14.4, yeah, pretty, it's not too bad. The DHEA is dipping. So more than likely they're dripping into that DHEA pool to make more stress hormones and hopefully kickstart some sex hormones. But remember, DHEA protects the brain, but not a lot going on there. And then you see they're trending low on their thyroid and their TSH is obviously is elevated. Uh, and so, well, what's influencing that, right? So we see, and this is an executive who's under a lot of stress. Right away, this would be a good example of someone that would need a salivary or urinary cortisol to look at what their diurnal pattern is doing uh, with their cortisol output during the course of a day. So you could think of, you know, doing a four, you know, a four point salivary or a, or a uh, urinary cortisol. Now, in addition to that, here's where the, where the wheels are starting to come off the cart. If you look here, they have a fasting insulin of 19. Their BMI is elevated. Their ferritin pool is actually going up high, which is a characteristic of insulin resistance. And then their glucose is at 95 and their hemoglobin A1C uh, is at 5.5. And uh, so the fasting glucose at 95 indicates that basically they've got a, uh, you know, a, you know, 60% risk of being diabetic over the next decade. And their adiponectin pool is dropping low. And that means that that chronic stress is there. So getting that four point salivary cortisol or a urinary cortisol could be incredibly important. If you notice down at the bottom, their potassium is low and their red blood cell magnesium is low. Why is that so important? Well, because low magnesium status is a, you know, one of the number one indicators for the development of metabolic syndrome. So we have to call that out. And uh, typically we want to see that number, you know, up, a, a, you know, a little bit more, more up around uh, at least uh, 5.8 or 6 
Uh, so this is kind of showing that this is someone that's looming. This is an insulin resistant, pre-diabetic kind of person. Even though their glucose is in a normal range, they're pumping out too much fasting insulin. They're gaining weight. There's a, so they're loading into this triad. And I don't know why my, there we go. And then we take a look at what's going on in uh, gut immune brain. And we see that the C-reactive protein is, is starting to elevate. Uh, eosinophils, monocytes, and basophils are elevated. So when you add those together, so when you see that you know, the monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils add up and it's over, you know, you know, I, honestly, I don't like to see it, you know, above 10, right? This person, their monocytes are at 11, their eosinophils are at four and their basophils are at one. You know, so that's telling you that their immune system is becoming reactive and more than likely food is probably an issue that they may have some food intolerances when we see there are monocytes and eosinophils and basophils going up. You could consider food allergy testing on this individual, especially if in the questionnaire they're complaining of any GI distress or, or a lot of weight gain. Uh, and then in addition to this, you obviously see that their vitamin D is low. But now we take a look at where they're at. You know, they're an, APO, they're an APOE 3, 4. Their homocysteine levels are at 12 and their vitamin B12 levels are low. So it could be as simple as their B vitamins are low. Uh, but we see that this person is loading with their immune system to start to create cardiometabolic issues because their immune system is becoming activated. Uh, they're apo they're an apoe three four that you know that you know that means that more than likely you know sap fat they got to be very careful with. And now we start to see how this really starts to weigh in on the individual, right? And you can, you know, just imagine your patient looking at all these reds going, I got to get to work on this because this person has insulin resistance, their APOE status is loading and, and they've got this immune activation going on. They're under chronic stress. Their thyroid is sluggish. So that's going to have an effect on their lipids. And now we see their apolipoprotein B is elevated. Their fibrinogen, their blood is too sticky. Their, you know, their uh, oxidized LDL is elevated and they also have an elevated lipoprotein little a. So this person's becoming a vascular pass. So it's becoming really important that we understand that where do I start to work with this individual to try to shut off this downstream effect? And of course, when we look here, not too much going on in the liver lymph uh, overall, but look at their triglycerides. So they're loading triglycerides, once again, a feature of insulin resistance, and, and it's showing up. But otherwise, their liver's holding up pretty well. Kidneys, they've got a little bit, little bit elevation of uric acid, a little bit of uh, you know, electrolyte imbalance, nothing too bad there. And of course, their GFR is healthy, so we're not worried about that. But now we start to see where there may be issues. As we all know, when people, men get under chronic stress, their prolactins will go up because of low, and then they start to create low testosterone. And he's a perfect example of a 332 testosterone. But if all we do is say, oh, give him testosterone, but we don't correct the inflammatory stress axis that's going on, there's, there's little chance that this is going to be effective for him. And oh, by the way, if we correct for those, and we correct for the excessive, probably excessive cortisol signaling when we look at his diurnal pattern. He's going to be dependent on using that testosterone, where if we correct for it and we manage cortisol and get it back to normal, we'll start to re return to making sex hormones. And so this is how, you know, and, you know what it starts to look like in summary. Uh, we start to see that you know, here are all the labs that influence triad one. And we use arrows up and down uh, because the individual is at, you know, glo global stress. And then, of course, we look at the other triads and we have the same indications that, you know, their apolipoprotein B, uh, their fibrinogen, their potassium, their T4, their, their red blood cell magnesium. There's a lot of labs that are loading into 
uh, this triad three relationship. And the reason we do this is, is because because when you correct this and the numbers start to go down on their metaflammation index and the numbers start to go down on their individual labs, the arrows go away, the boxes go away, the numbers tumble down. They go from red to yellow to green. And that shows them visually what is going on metabolically in their body. Now, I'm not saying that you just rely only on these labs. We may need to do a toxic metal urine test on this individual. You may decide on another test that you want to you want to provide to help to decipher why the person's shifts are this way. But what this does do for you is start to create a global scoring system. And we worked with uh, actually the Department of Medical Informatics at George at, at GW's. Uh, uh, at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and and so we you know we have a lot that goes behind the algorithm. Of, you know, some you know, I don't even want to tell you how many thousands of decisions that are that are worked into this, but they've been worked on over the last decade to be able to start to tether the data together. What happens when two or three or four or five disparate lab values start to cons constellate to co consolidate down? like a constellation, right? And start to put pressure in one of these networks. People can quickly understand five networks that they need to understand when all we do is throw down. And the only reason I did this guys was, I was finding myself when we were doing our practice, you know, in Ohio initially, hundreds of people a week saying the same thing over and over again. And I, you know, I found that I needed to make it easier and simpler for them to understand. And so once again, this just kind of shows you where they're at overall. So, you know, and, and let me show you how these things cross correlate. For example, sex hormones in the kidneys. Where can we look at where his future risk may be? So gonadal dysfunction, common occurrence in people with CKD. Low testosterone is increased to risk of death in people with CKD. Uh, and, you know, obviously males have a higher predominance of CKD. Um, estrogens actually play a role in the reduction of progression of some renal diseases. And so where is this gentleman going? Pre-diabetic, not, well, not even pre-diabetic, he's insulin resistant right now, right? He's pumping out a lot of insulin. His blood sugars are kind of, you know, kind of trending high. But his dyslipidemia, he is on a blood pressure medication, right? We're starting to see these things moving in that direction to where you can be predictive for where his future is. And one of his future is right now, because of his insulin resistance, because of that reduction in blood flow to the kidneys, because of his lower testosterone is that, you know, CKD is, is in his future potentially. This was kind of a, a, a cohort study that showed that, you know, when they treated the group, they had a significant delay in the progression of CKD and treated men at a 24% decreased risk uh, and a 25% decreased risk of death when compared to untreated males. This was a veteran study from the national, it was presented at the National Kidney Foundation in 2017. And my slide's not advancing. There we go. All right. Another study in 2008 showed, uh, you know, 2,000 German men aged 20 to 79, those with low testosterone, two and a half times greater risk of dying over the next 10 years for all-cause mortality. And, and so, you know, basically you've heard this uh, before, but what this is showing is that where my labs are today, if I start to look at it instead of one single lab, but cast a wide net for a global picture of where my labs are, the ones that are accepted in healthcare, and then we use the functional labs that we know make a difference to support our theorem of how we're going to treat that patient. We then can start to say, where do I start? What triad, you know, what, you know, which area is the most disrupted and focus on that. For this gentleman, if I don't start to work on blood sugar, get his diet changed, use things like alpha lipoic acid, glucose, get his red blood cell magnesium level up. If I don't start to move that needle and if I don't look at his stress and talk to him and look at his questionnaire and understand where his stress is at, does he need something 
like a theanine or a relora in order to move the needle and dampen his chronic executive stress. And if I can't help to restore his gonadal signaling, so, you know, agents like Uricoma longifolia, we developed one, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that's a testosterone um, support uh, that I think is really effective. You know, so I think that, you know, these are the things that we need to do. You need to cut problems off where you can, and you need to use testing to validate and track your theorem so that you have that type of, you know, value to your practice. You can show from you know, not just visit to visit, but maybe every three months or every four months where the person is at. And um, again, having issues with my slide. There we go. Um, once again, men low, with low testosterone, low sex hormone bonding dominant, and low free testosterone, significantly more likely to have metabolic syndrome. We all kind of really know that nowadays. And remember estrogen's effect on the kidneys. It's, estrogen is nephroprotective. And, you know, it, it's incredibly important because it reverses TGF beta one, and that means it's going to reduce uh, apoptosis of cells. And so, you know, estrogen does play a protective role. So, you know, yes, men have estrogen, women have estrogen, and we want men and women both to have healthy estrogen, right? So healthy estrogen metabolites. And so, you know, this was just some simple things that I wanted you to, to make sure I left you with because we've got about four minutes left. Um, red blood cell magnesium, way more clinically important than just serum mag, although you could use a serum mag, but RBC mag um, directly correlated with increased HOMA IR and higher risk for cardiovascular diseases. As I had mentioned, I, you know, I want somebody in that range of 5.7 to 6.2. Uh, and I got to tell you, most people aren't there. Most people aren't eating enough vegetables to get their magnesium. Uh, they're not eating enough green vegetables anyway to get their magnesium. So it's incredibly important to measure and, and look at that because it's a key marker. And for some reason, oh, there we go. And mean platelet volume, I already talked about that. Platelet size demonstrates metaflammation. It's predictive and prognostic as a biomarker for cardiovascular events in the future. And it's associated with pro-inflammatory events, changes in M MPV. Is reported to be an important mark marker for bio for inflammatory processes. So, you know, man, when you see uh, mean platelet volume is off, then you know there's some hidden inflammation going on somewhere. And a lot of times people don't recognize that. Adiponectin, of course, incredibly important because, well, you know, it, it really makes the insulin receptor more sensitive. And it increases glucose transport. And really, it's a big target in front of the pharma side. It has anti-atherogenic properties. You can, uh, you know, it, you know, when you have a lot of chronic inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and TNF-alpha, which are common um, under duress or under intoxication, or if you think of people that have maybe mold burden, uh, it inhibits adiponectin release. And the higher your adiponectin, the lower the risk of MI. So adiponectin is a really nice target to follow. And I kind of gave you the ranges right here. And of course, we follow those ranges based on clinical data. And of course, oxidized LDL is incredibly important because it's given us an idea of global oxidative stress. So it, it obviously increases and correlates, you know, coronary artery risk. If you're wanting to reduce oxidized LDL simply, aged garlic extract, kyolic aged garlic extract, you know, you give, um, personally, I, I, I like to give 2,400 milligrams a day uh, because it reduces vulnerable plaque, it reduces, you know, blood pressures, uh, it decreases oxidized LDL, it has an effect on apolipoprotein B, so it's really one of those multitasking nutrients. It's got, you know, I mean, I mean, literally hundreds of publications on its effect, but it's got to be aged garlic extract. And of course, we kind of talked about this. And remember, those monocytes get ticked off. So if you're in a chronic inflammatory state, you're making those inflammatory monocytes, which are triggering uh, immune activation and attacks on your uh, your, 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 uh, linings of your, of your vascular network. Well, 
it's not wanting to respond to my clicker. And of course, particle number is important and particle size. I mean, where are your particle sizes at? Smaller the particle, the more damaging stress influences this. Metaflammation, without a doubt, big impact in this. So if you're insulin resistant, high stress, more than likely your particle number is going to be really big. And that means that you're going to make really small cholesterol and you've got it. You've got to be able to attack that. But if all I do is give people red yeast rice and I give them aged garlic and I don't know that triad one is driving it, I don't realize that cortisol and thyroid and, and uh, pancreas, insulin and glucose relationships, that triad is at the top of this individual's issue, uh, then I'm in trouble, right? So, you know, incredibly important to realize that. I've only got two more slides, so I'll try to go through these real quickly. And of course, really important to understand pH, and I'll show you why in uh, just one second here. Let's get to the last one on pH. I hope it was there. Nope, it wasn't there. You know, urinary pH is directly correlated. If you're an acidotic pH, you have more vascular stress, and that's been published in multiple papers at this point. So monitoring urinary and salivary pH is a great way to measure oxidative stress but it also shows progression towards cardiometabolic disease. So don't forget that. That's an easy tool that you can do. And then this is just an advantage, you know, one of the you know, panels that you can do uh, through the metabolic code via Wellovate Labs uh, is our SERS panel, for example, which uh, of course has to do with people that are mold exposed and immune activated. So what I hope you found in our time is that when you start to organize labs, basic labs, you can literally start to show where do you begin to work in an organized fashion and more importantly, target getting results quickly with an individual. Let those numbers tumble downward. So I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Jim. Now, I wasn't kidding when I talked about the amount of valuable information that he can pack into a single session. So now you know what I mean if it's the first time that you've listened to Jim here. Um, thank you so much. I mean, it's what I love is that you really show how you can gain so much functionally related information, even from just standard conventional lab testing. I know you've referenced some specialty testing, but someone asked what type of test is this? This is standard conventional lab testing. Yeah, it absolutely is. You can order this, this lab test and, uh, you know, we, we have it to where it is, uh, you order it through Quest, it automatically pipes into the platform and delivers a report to you. And, and I didn't show a complete report, but the report also explains every blood test to the individual, explains you know, what triad one is, what are your adrenals, what's your pancreas. It's a very robust report of you know, some 60 pages, but I just highlighted kind of the thought and the thesis behind it. Great. Thank you so much. So just a couple of questions that came in around some specifics. So are, is there an instance where fasting insulin could be too low? And what would that mean? Well, if fasting insulin is too low, that could mean that you've exhausted your, you know, your beta cells, right? So if you're in, if you have a very low fasting insulin and yet a high glucose, that means that, uh oh, I've, I'm starting to exhaust my potential for insulin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then someone else asked a very related question, which is what are, what would be your approach or what are your favorite nutraceuticals to stimulate beta cells when there is low normal production of insulin or would you use glandular products? Well, I, that, that's a great question. I think once again, what you have to do is you have to understand, well, where is it coming from? Is this a triad two problem? Meaning that they're reacting to foods. They've got a lot of you know, uh, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So there's a lot of pro-inflammatory effect that's going on that's creating inefficiency in those beta cells. Is it that um, the insulin receptors are uh, having problems and therefore there's a lot of insulin resistance? So you really, you know, what's nice about looking at this in these, you know, five metabotypes is it starts to point at, well, where is the problem? And then you can look downstream and say, well, how does that relate to the, I have the beta cells, right? Um, I think that's the key thing is understanding relationships or the stacking between these triads. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then what is the optimal MPV range that you utilize? Do you know that off the top of your head? 
Well, I mean, with, with mean platelet volume, what I always tell people is you don't want to be above the third quartile. So, you know, you know, sometimes labs have different instances of what they report as normal. So you wouldn't want to be above the third quartile on a mean platelet volume when it's trending high or at high, either high normal or out of bounds, then you know that somebody is in looming metaflammation. Great. And we're actually getting a lot of questions in around like, how do I use metabolic code? Um, maybe you can speak for a little bit about how to sign up. We, you can sign up through Emerson, um, but what's the cost? How do they get access to it? Hey, that's great. I mean, if, if you're interested in the metabolic code, first of all, you can sign up directly through through Emerson, which which is great. Cost varies depending on whether you know you want to you want labs, you want to use questionnaire only, uh, and you can go to metaboliccode.com and it and it really it shows the pricing and kind of gives you the idea of what you pay per month. The nice thing is, is that you can do as many reports as you want in a month. So if you think about giving people a 50 page report that explains everything to them and your ability to quantify what you're doing, if you do 10 or 15 of those a month, uh, you've, you've paid for yourself because I can tell you that when I started using this in my own practice, you know, it was the best advertising tool I could have had because people were showing it to their friends and they're all calling in wanting to get a metabolic code report. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, so, you know, basically it, you know, it can, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a monthly fee, but it's ranged depending on what your desire is. And I think that the fees are pretty reasonable. Yeah, they are on a, especially if you are using it regularly in practice. And I think, I think the other question I have around that is I'd be curious to know within the triads, what are the ones that you tend to see flag first? Like, I love how you say focus on what gets people feeling better first, because if you're focusing on some, you know, metric that doesn't actually change the way someone feels, they're not going to be as invested. You want to make those quick early wins to get them with you for the long haul to really overhaul everything. So what comes up for people most commonly that you see that you can really target and make a big difference in? Oh, yeah. I mean, invariably. Triad one and two, gut immune brain, thyroid adrenal pancreas. And, and the problem is, even though those may come up, you may have a lab like a GFR in triad four. If their kidney GFR is at, you know, 50, uh, you know, you may want to give an additional nutrient to help them, you know, as you're correcting the big problem. But a triad one and two is typically where people end up falling out. You know, they've got their gut microbiome's off, their food allergic, their immune system's off, their brain's foggy, they're anxious, you know, they don't have any energy, their circadian pattern's off. I mean, let's face it, you got what, you know, you know, a massive percent of individuals in the U.S. are insulin resistant or, or diabetic. Uh, so a lot of people gaining weight. So you see that triad one, triad two showing up a lot. And you know what? When you get people to feel less stressed and you get them to crave less, because a lot of people are like, I, I really want to be on this diet, but I'm, I can't help it. I'm craving, you know, when you can target what makes a person feel better, they're going to come back to you and say, hey, what else do you got for me? And that's mm -hmm. always the way I've practiced. And, and guess what? When somebody feels better, typically their labs are going to get better, too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim. I hope you guys uh, appreciated his talk as much as I did. And if you want to learn more, actually just go to emersonecologics.com and our billboard on the homepage right now is metabolic code. So you can click there and that will connect you right in to learn, learn more. So thank you so much, Jim. My pleasure.